Good morning, everybody. It's a new time for the data science seminar on this sunny Wednesday. Um, for the live stream audience, you can paste comments and questions off the bottom of the live stream window. And the questions afterwards will be moderated. So a warm welcome to our speaker today, Elisabeth Hoppe. Elisabeth is a PhD student in Andreas Meyer's Pattern Recognition Lab at the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg. And last year, she was awarded as an AI newcomer, and um, this was in the category Life Science. We are really happy to have her here. Welcome, Elisabeth Hoppe. She will talk today about deep learning-based magnetic resonance fingerprinting. And now it's your turn, Elisabeth. Thank you for being here. So um, thank you for the very nice introduction, Doreen. I'm happy um, to be here and to talk to you um, today about deep learning based magnetic resonance fingerprinting. Uh, yeah, um, so I will um, try to cover um, at the first step um, the magnetic resonance basics and uh, the basics about the fingerprinting acquisition and reconstruction method so we can understand how we can apply then uh, deep learning approaches um, to this topic or to this application. And uh, in the main part of my talk, I will, um, I will give you an overview about the deep learning projects we made at our lab um, for the application to magnetic resonance fingerprinting. And um, um, at the end of my talk, I will uh, give you just some more examples for other projects that uh, came up recently for uh, magnetic resonance fingerprinting. So um, let's start uh, with the uh, very basic basic um, of magnetic resonance imaging. So I think most of you know that uh, magnetic resonance imaging is a non-invasive imaging uh, technique of especially soft tissues. As you can see here, it is well suitable for a brain, liver, knee, or heart. And um, um, the principle behind um, this technique is that uh, magnetic resonance imaging uses uh, the hydrogen nuclear, uh, which are largely contained in the human cells. And the specialty about this uh, um, spins is that they are nuclear magnetic resonance capable and they are able to absorb and emit electromagnetic radiation uh, when they are excited at resonance in a magnetic field. And this strong magnetic field, B0, is also the first component of um, the whole magnetic uh, resonance system. And um, this uh, uh, magnetic field produces a strong magnetic field. Uh, and this is used to align all the um, spins uh, in our body uh, in one direction. So um, the magnetization vector points uh, into M0 at the first step. And the second step of the acquisition is um, when we apply um, a time varying radio frequency field to the system with a specific flip angle uh, alpha. And by this, we add energy to um, the system. Um, and uh, um, the whole system is then flipped to another plane. For example, with a 90 degree flip angle, we will end up in the XY plane. And um, this is called the excitation state. And the next step of the acquisition is when we switch off the uh, frequency, uh, radio frequency pulse. Um, and then the system tries to relaxate and to get, uh, get back to its initial state. And by, the, uh, by this process, um, uh, the added energy is emitted. And um, this introduces a uh, voltage in our receiver called, and by, um, so we get a signal that we can measure. Uh, and this last state is called the relaxation state. And if we have um, a detailed look um, at it, we can describe this relaxation state uh, using two time constants. So um, these are the main um, physical time constants we use for magnetic resonance. Um, the first one um, describes um, the time which is needed to, re um, to, to get back to the initial magnetic um, states. And the um, second one, the transverse component of the magnetization, describes 
um, the um, how um, how um, the spins in the xy plane uh, uh, diminish and um, they assume an increasingly random phase. And uh, the most important about this time content uh, constants is that um, they depend on different tissues and tissue states. So, for example, if you have um, one tissue, um, it will have um, different uh, relaxation times than another tissue. Um, and also healthy and unhealthy tissue types um, will, uh, will have different relaxation times. So um, by using this uh, or measuring this relaxation times, we can measure the physical process behind the tissues we are imaging. And um, these uh, two time constants are only um, a subset of the quantitative parameters we can measure with um, our MR scanner, but uh, we will only concentrate on these two in this talk. So, and so um, um, most of the MR sequences are so-called qualitative sequences. This means that we, uh, we see um, the different tissues uh, and the borders of the tissues, but we don't have a clue what um, the intensity values means because uh, if we just uh, if we um, scan, um, for example, our brain with uh, one type of sequence, we will oh, sorry we will end up uh, with um, some intensity values, and if we change some parameters in the sequence, we will end up with another intensity values for the same tissue. So um, MR is not quantitative at all at the first glance. And what we uh, want with magnetic resonance fingerprinting is we want uh, to have multiple acquisitions and end up with um, the, same, um, the same quantitative value in the end. So you can um, somehow, um, uh, it, it is similar, for example, with CT, where we have Hounsfield units, um, which are quantitative. So, um, and this brings us to um, the magnetic resonance fingerprinting, which is a quantitative imaging technique. So what um, the aim of um, magnetic resonance fingerprinting is, uh, we have a qualitative image and uh, uh, we have a qualitative image here. And what we want to have is we want to have quantitative maps of the T1 and T2 relaxations, for example. So how does this work? Um, for uh, the general approach in our fingerprinting, fingerprinting has uh, three main steps. So the first step is a randomized acquisition. So um, with this acquisition type, we try to generate for every image position um, a characteristic fingerprint or time series. So if we... Um, uh, we acquire multiple timestamps at every image position and um, depending on which tissue type it is or which tissue state it is, this uh, time series will look different. And um, the second step is to apply some kind of pattern recognition methods on this acquired um, fingerprints and to extract the pattern uh, we have in this fingerprints um, to assign um, quantitative information from this pattern and from this time series. So um, let's have a look um, in more detail on the acquisition and reconstruction process in MR fingerprinting. So um, um, the acquisition um, um, in MR fingerprinting um, um, uh, um, so we acquire um, not only uh, one particular slice with one particular imaging contrast, but we acquire multiple timestamps of the same slice. Uh, and at each time point in the sequence, we have um, a varying set of the parameters. So we will end up at each time point with a slightly different imaging contrast. And these um, acquisitions are very undersampled in order to, to make the acquisition faster. Because if you would um, acquire 
um, one slice every time fully assembled, it would uh, take ages because um, for MR fingerprinting, for example, we acquire 3000 data points for one slice. So, and if we have a look at one image position over time, we see that we have uh, so some kind of time series and this time series look different for um, different tissues. And then we can just use, for example, a pre-simulated dictionary, which gives us possible fingerprints for possible parameter settings. And we try to, um, to, to compare this dictionary with our measured fingerprint and um, to, to get the quantitative parameters from that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for the acquisition, again, um, we have um, this special um, excitation um, and as a special set of parameters for each time point. Um, for example, we use in our sequence, we use different flip angles at every time point and different repetition time, which gives us um, this fingerprint. Um, yeah, for the dictionary generation, it is a simulated dictionary. So um, because we know at every time point, we know um, the acquisition parameters and we know which quantitative parameters we want to have. In the end, we can simulate um, the, the possible signals by using block equations. So, and the matching is um, just, um, we, we try to find our measured fingerprint within the simulated dictionary. And because for every a fingerprint in the dictionary, we know the quantitative parameters. We can just take them and assign them to the acquired signal. And um, if we do this for every image um, position we acquired, we will end up with a quantitative map. So um, um, this was uh, magnetic resonance fingerprinting in a nutshell. And now uh, let's have a look um, at the reconstruction more. So. Um, those the state of the art reconstruction for magnetic resonance fingerprinting was um, uh, introduced with the um, with the standard uh, with the with the uh, first magnetic resonance fingerprinting in 2013, and it is a quite simple simple matching a pattern matching <clears throat> method. So we have our measured signal um, MS. And we just and we have our dictionary with um, somehow simulated uh, fingerprints, and we just compute um, the inner products from this measured fingerprint with all, every signal in the dictionary. And uh, for the um, assignment of the quantitative values, we take the uh, um, inner product with the maximum value. It's very simple approach. Um, another simple approach that was uh, also um, uh, proposed with the standard uh, MR fingerprinting sequence uh, is um, is quite um, quite similar, but uh, there is just one improvement in there. So again, we have our measured signal, uh, and we have our dictionary with um, all the dictionary signals. And what we do as a first step is we try to cluster the dictionary into um, some um, amount of groups. And, and in every group, we, of course, have uh, very similar fingerprints. And um, uh, we have, um, uh, we have um, Just one moment. <laughs> so, uh, we have um, the most similar fingerprints in one group. And uh, for every group, we also compute a mean signal. And what we do as a first step by matching, uh, uh, for the matching, we match um, the measured signal with, uh, with every mean signal of the group and just select the group with the most um, similar mean signal. And the second step is just to uh, to compute uh, the matching between our measured signal and every fingerprint within the group. 
So um, this would reduce um, the computational time, of course. So um, what are the drawbacks uh, behind the simple pattern matching methods? Of course, uh, the first one is that um, this discrete dictionary um, can only have a finite amount of possible fingerprints. And uh, these may uh, yield um, uh, errors in the computed maps because we can only um, select um, the quantitative parameters from that that are in the dictionary. And uh, the second and uh, most severe drawback here is that um, this method is uh, quite uh, expensive in terms of storage or time. So, um, so we here we concentrate on only T1 and T2. These are two dimensions uh, in the dictionary, but uh, of course there are much more. And with every new dimension, there uh, the storage increases and also the time used um, um, to compute the quantitative. Uh, map increases because we have to uh, compare our measured signal with every uh, signal in the dictionary in the worst case. And also uh, by uh, defining some step size, the step size, I mean um, the, the, um, the distance between uh, two fingerprints. Um, of course, we want to have um, um, the step size as small as possible, but as um, the smaller the step size between two fingerprints, the more fingerprints we have. And of course, um, it introduces um, and uh, um, introduces uh, it increases the computational time. So, um, yeah, because of this drawbacks, we um, or our lab came up with the idea um, to replace this dictionary matching approach with a deep learning. So this means uh, what we wanted to do was we wanted to um, take a fingerprint um, as input to a, a deep neural network and, um, and let the network uh, learn automatically which patterns are in the fingerprints and how they correlate with uh, the quantitative parameters. So um, this would be a very efficient solution because we don't need the dictionary anymore and we just have to forward pass our, um, our measured or simulated fingerprints to the network and we will get the quantitative parameters. Yeah, and um, so in the next part of, the, of my talk, I would like to report you how we did um, this and uh, which projects we were working on in um, this area. <clears throat> so um, our first step, so I started on these projects in 2017. And as you may know, so uh, it is uh, four, uh, four years back and it is a large step. Uh, uh, so four years are a large step in, in terms of uh, deep learning and uh, back then we just tried a very, very um, a simple approach. Um, so we we had um, a supervised regression combined with convolutional neural network. So it was um, quite intuitive. What we wanted to have as output uh, was um, the um, the continuous quantitative parameters t1 and t2, and um, the, um, we applied a convolutional neural network uh, and the input was uh, one fingerprint. So we, uh, we used the magnitude signal out of fingerprints, uh, fed it into the CNN and the CNN gave us the T1 and T2. And um, so um, if you have a look at um, um, this simulated fingerprints at first, you can see that um, the changes between the fingerprints, you cannot see it clearly here, but because the changes are very small, if you compare fingerprints that just differ in one parameter in 10 millisecond steps, uh, and if you compare the first and the last uh, fingerprint in the dictionary, the changes uh, are increasing. So the changes between fingerprints are somehow linearly distributed. And um, so um, the first step, that we did here is we applied 
a convolutional neural network, which was quite simple. Um, so we had only three convolutional layers with small kernel sizes. Um, we, at the end, we had a pooling layer and a fully convolutional layer. And yeah, the output was, of course, um, two values for T1 and T2. Um, the training was quite f uh, straightforward because we just used a, um, a L2 uh, loss function and we used um, the well-known um, Adam optimizer and the gradient descent for training. Um, yeah, and um, first of all, we focused on uh, the simulated fingerprints because it's a quite simple problem to solve. So uh, as you as you have seen in the previous um, slide, the fingerprints are clear. There are no artifacts or uh, no noise really presented. Um, and we can extract the patterns in a quite straightforward way. Um, what we used here was also a simulated dictionary uh, with about 120,000 um, fingerprints. And so uh, we trained um, our um, architecture on this data. And what we, uh, what we see for the results is not really su surprising because so what we see here is that uh, the network is, um, is uh, um, and the network has no difficulties to um, estimate the T1 and T2 values. And um, here we have uh, larger errors for the smaller quantitative values that uh, comes from because uh, we just used an unweighted loss function. And um, what we also see is that we um, even if we don't have uh, fingerprints in the training set with a specific quantitative uh, parameter, these, uh, if we use these fingerprints only in testing, the network is, um, is able to predict this quantitative parameter. So the, uh, the network is somehow um, able to interpolate between uh, two similar fingerprints. Um, and it is, um, it's um, able to uh, to predict continuous um, values instead of only the discrete ones we had in the dictionary. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and if we have have a look at the results concerning the runtime and uh, the storage requirements, so here we compared the runtime for matching of one fingerprint using um, the dictionary with about 120 entries. Um, the, Inner product matching that was um, the first state of the art, uh, the first state of the art uh, matching, and this fast group matching with um, the clustering step before the matching process. Uh, here we see that our um, network is, of course, uh, much faster um, than. Um, this two matching methods, and of course, if you go to the GPU, you can. Um, decrease the running time again. And for the storage requirements, uh, for this dictionary, which is quite a small dictionary uh, for uh, fingerprinting, um, uh, we have, uh, um, we could reduce the storage uh, by using a CNN because we don't need to store every simulated fingerprint. So, yeah. And um, of course, because we uh, at the first step, we just used the simulated fingerprints. Um, the next question was, can we, uh, uh, can we apply this uh, network directly to the measured fingerprints? Um, is the network uh, still capable to extract um, the patterns and to give us uh, a meaningful reconstruction of quantitative parameter maps? Uh, here I can say no, it's not. <laughs> so as you can see here, if you apply directly um, your uh, trained network on measured data, you will end up with a very corrupted reconstructions. Uh, here you see it's uh, very noisy. You can hardly see any kind of structure, and you can say it's a completely failure on real uh, measured fingerprints. 
because we have this st strong influence from um, from the signal acquisition and from um, the strong undersampling. And uh, why is this? So if you compare um, uh, compare the measured fingerprints with the simulated ones, you see that um, the the measured uh, signal is uh, largely destroyed by um, especially the um, strong undersampling. So here in red, you see um, the matched dictionary signal and blue is the measured one. And um, more important is that if you um, compare two measured signals that were matched to the same dictionary entry, you see that they differ a lot. So you end up with different signals for one set of quantitative parameters because um, because the undersampling um, um, influence is highly dependent on the spatial location and also on the object geometry itself. So you can say that uh, that uh, the signal in one voxel is um, somehow um, mixed up with signals from other voxels because of this undersampling and acquisition method. So and. Um, yeah, so you can say that through undersampling, you get uh, um, ambiguity of signals for one parameter. And um, what we did as a first step here to to um, to get the system run on measured uh, signals, we uh, tried to um, to adapt our um, previously proposed architecture to to the measured signals. Yeah. And what we did here is we trained, um, we first, so um, it was um, our first experiments on real measured um, data. We um, trained it with, um, with six slices from, uh, from um, brain acquisitions. And um, yeah, six slices at the first glance, it um, seems like it's not really uh, that much, but if you, um, if you imagine that um, these acquisitions have a resolution of um, 256 times 256, you you have um, thousands of fingerprints in in one slice. Yeah, and uh, what we wanted to do, we trained um, our previously proposed model and just some kind of extended model on um, on uh, the measured data. And what we also wanted to test is. Um, um, this model, uh, the model on also other orientations of the scans. Yeah, um, yeah, and what we can see for um, for the results is that um, if we um, with um, the larger model, of course, we can reduce um, um, the artifacts and the noise in the reconstructed maps. Um, and the same uh, we have for T two. But um, the problem is still that if we um, apply this model to other orientations, we will end up with a completely distorted reconstruction. So uh, what we see here is that our model was still not uh, able to generalize from one, um, one orientation to another, and that um, this undersampling um, artifacts are also um, are also um, quite different for different orientations. Yeah. So um, yeah. Um, so 2070. Uh, we uh, the lessons we learned here is when we just started with magnetic resonance fingerprinting is that we have uh, simulated fingerprints in the dictionary that are uh, quite clear. Um, a clear um, that have quite clear patterns, um, which are um, easy um, to learn um, with quite um, simple networks, and these uh, networks can clearly outperform dictionary matching methods in terms of runtime and storage. But um, um, this um, strong undersampling that, that exists uh, in real acquisitions. Um, uh, are a big challenge for deep learning based reconstruction. Um, so, 
um, and at this step, we wanted to make some improvements and we wanted to cope with these uh, challenges. Uh, and uh, what, we, what we did here uh, um, is that, uh, first of all, we wanted um, to use all components of the complex signal because at this time there were also some papers that, um, um, that stated that uh, using the complex signals instead of the magnitude signals um, is beneficial for uh, um, for deep learning based uh, fingerprinting. We also tr uh, tried other architectures, not only uh, convolutional uh, neural networks. And um, um, the third step we uh, improved here was that instead of using just one thing, uh, fingerprint as input to the network, we used a small um, neighboring uh, spatial patches because uh, we assume that um, the quantitative um, quantitative values in a, a in a um, in a patch will be more or less similar, and if we have an outlier there, we can uh, remove this outlier by using um, the signals from uh, from the neighbors. Yeah, um, and one project I would like to present uh, now here is called um, the ring fingerprinting that was presented at the last year's Mikai. So here we combined a recurrent neural network. So instead of a convolutional neural network, we tried to uh, learn um, the patterns that are correlated with, um, um, with time within a fingerprint. And uh, we used a so-called quanta layer at the end of our network um, to uh, to be able to uh, to remove this um, noisy outlier signals, so um, so the whole um, um, the whole um, uh, architecture here is we have a um, three times three uh, patch with um, two channels now. Uh, two channels are the real and um, the imaginary part. Um, the first layer of um, the network was a reshape. A layer which we used to reshape our long um, 3,000 data point signal into um, uh, into small patches. So we uh, we had um, uh, 30 um, parts. Uh, we divided the fingerprint in 30 even parts um, to in order to keep the sequence in a moderate size. For the um, recurrent layer, we used the long short-term memory uh, uh, layer. And uh, so um, in the end, we used a quanta layer, which is, um, which is um, um, a, a 0 0.5 quantile um, edge-preserving denoising filter. So it's uh, more or less um, like a pooling layer, which is, uh, um, which is uh, edge preserving, yeah. So, and um, here in this um, uh, experiment, we uh, we wanted to uh, to compare um, our recurrent neural network with um, patches, um, with recurrent neural network um, that was just uh, run on a, a single fingerprint input, and uh, of course we wanted to compare it with our. Um, Previously proposed simple convolutional neural network, which was is operating on a magnitude fingerprint signal. Yeah, uh, and what we used here for training and tests. So here we had uh, um, two uh, two slices from uh, four volunteers um, acquired on a um, three Tesla scanner at um, Siemens, and uh, yeah, we distributed the slices randomly, of course, for training, validation, and testing. And for the ground truth data, we used here now um, more uh, a fine resolved dictionary with, uh, it was quite large with about 700,000 uh, possible combinations. And because it was so, so, uh, um, so large, we had to reduce uh, here um, the signals and the dictionary entries uh, but, um, during the process of um, ground truth generation because otherwise it would have taken ages. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, for our um, results, let's have a look first at the quantitative uh, 
uh, results. So um, from here we can clearly see that um, this uh, complex valued inputs uh, have a positive effect on the results and also the RNNs uh, could outperform the CNNs. So and um, let's have a look at um, the qualitative results first. Um, the results uh, from our um, uh, simple CNN uh, trained on um, on uh, magnitude signals and also on complex signals. And what we can see here um, is that we have um, on the on the one side we have some um, some uh, reduced errors using the complex data. But uh, in every uh, case, we have uh, a very, very um, um, destroyed reconstruction, destroyed by this heavy ringing artifact coming from the spiral uh, readout. Uh, if uh, we, we have a look at um, the, um, the uh, results uh, produced by the recurrent neural networks, we can here see a clear improvement from magnitude data to complex data. So here we see uh, the structures and uh, um, it's still uh, noisy, but we uh, we can, um, with the complex data, we can reduce this heavy ringing artifacts. And um, yeah, the last results here is that uh, um, with the with the patches, uh, we can um, we can further improve our results uh, by uh, by reducing um, the noisy outliers, yeah. and um, the edges are better preserved. So uh, um, the lessons we learned by uh, uh, in this project were um, that um, the complex valued inputs uh, can uh, uh, the reconstruction benefit from the complex valued input data by reducing especially these heavy ringing artifacts. And um, the RNNs here um, uh, uh, had uh, better results compared with our very simple convolutional neural network, and um, especially uh, combining a recurrent neural network with a quantile layer um, um, leads uh, to uh, uh, increased uh, reduction of uh, errors. Um, and um, there is a third project I would like to um, to um, report you about, um, um, which are, we are working on um, uh, for now. So um, the results are very preliminary. So it's called uh, cleaning the fingerprints. What does this mean? So um, as we learned from uh, from previous. Um, projects, uh, we saw that um, um, we have a very, very strong undersampling, which um, somehow destroy our signals. And this undersampling artifacts are not, um, they're really incoherent, so they differ a lot uh, between different subjects, orientations, and so on. And, uh, but we also have seen that um, the clean simulated like fingerprints, um, are a quite easy deep learning problem because you can um, just use a very, very, um, a very simple uh, neural network and um, replace the dictionary matching uh, by a simple neural network if you have this clean simulated like fingerprints. And um, the question we were asking ourselves here is, can we just take the measured fingerprints, um, which are undersampled and noisy, and can we convert this fingerprint somehow into their clean version and just use this clean version of the fingerprints for a subsequent um, regression or the subsequent matching? So, uh, and um, what we came up with uh, or is a two-step um, approach. So um, the first step would be that we just use a, a, some kind of, um, of neural network which takes a measured fingerprint as input and convert this measured unassembled fingerprint into its clean version. And um, afterwards, we can just use our previously uh, proposed network um, 
uh, and uh, and um, uh, get our quantitative maps. So um, yeah, um, yeah. This um, this project or the first results of this project uh, uh, will be hopefully <laughs> presented at the, this year's ISMRM, which was just um, um, converted also to um, online version. And um, so for the first step here, we used uh, uh, a well the well known. Um, the well-known uh, unit architecture. So uh, what we uh, have here as input is a, um, is a whole slice of fingerprints. Here now we use a whole slice because we want um, the network to see um, all the dependencies within one slice. Uh, and because every voxel in one slice is uh, uh, is a mixture of the voxels um, of the other voxels. We wanted to to provide um, the network the slice as a whole, so the network can uh, learn these dependencies and de-aliase uh, every pixel. And because we now use a whole slice, we had to compress the input because otherwise we would end up with an input size of. To, um, 2056 times 2056 times 3000 data points and um, this uh, for the complex uh, for the complex case we would uh, have um, this whole slice times two so um, so we compressed uh, we compressed the slices and um, for the ground truth we uh, we used the dictionary matched um, signals which we also compressed and um, used for training and um, yeah the second step is um, the step I already um, described to you at the very beginning we used this hopefully cleaned uh, fingerprint um, as input to our convolutional uh, neural network uh, which is quite the same in this case so and um, so here for the experiments we used um, an increased um, data pool. For now we had um, now um, ten volunteers and about eighty uh, slices, and uh, um, the data was coming here now from two scanners. So there was um, more variability in there. And for the ground truth, we used again a very fine resolved dictionary, which we also had to combine. Uh, to compress um, to be able to reconstruct um, the ground truth maps in a reasonable time and memory consumption. Uh, so, and um, yeah, the two main experiments here are that uh, first, of course, we have an experiment where we just trained um, our convolutional layer network on um, the, the row. Um, undersampled uh, measured fingerprints and in the second step uh, we first have a step where we cleaned the fingerprints with our unit and used this cleaned uh, uh, fingerprints for the training of our convolutional neural network yeah yeah we wanted to know is it possible to transform this measured fingerprints to a clean version and uh, because if we have this clean fingerprints, um, the regression is quite simple. So uh, what we can see from the preliminary results is, first of all, if we just use, um, so here you can see the ground truth maps, here the predicted maps, and here the error maps. Um, and here we can see the predicted maps from, uh, from a neural network trained on um, on the uncleaned uh, fingerprints. So it means we take just the measured fingerprints and take them as they are uh, for, for the training. As you can see here is that the reconstructions are quite, um, so um, we, we cannot see um, the structures here very clear. So, um, and the arrow maps are, so, um, so the reconstruction is more or less a, a mean quantitative value for every position. So, and um, if we um, have a look at the, um, the results of the second experiment, so first of all, uh, we can have a look at the intermediate um, results uh, where um, 
where you can see how how um, the slices are um, cleaned. So here we can see um, the input, um, uh, the input, the output, and the ground truth and the error map. So the first components are quite uh, clear as input, so there are no um, artifacts um, presented there. But if we have a look at um, uh, at the components that are uh, uh, corrupted by the ringing artifacts, we can see that um, the output of our uh, unit cleaning network is somehow so it uh, somehow can remove this uh, ringing artifacts, but it's still, of course, not perfect. But um, you can see here that the structure is um, is um, the structure is uh, appearing again. So the ringing artifacts are more or less gone. gone. And if you compare, um, if you have a look at the uh, reconstructed um, maps, then uh, you can see that they are much better than the previous version. So here you you can you can see the different structures with um, their different quantitative values, and um, yeah. So uh, you can um, uh, you can um, you can just uh, use this clean fingerprints for the reconstruction uh, for a reasonable uh, reconstruction. Yeah. So um, the lessons learned here at this project were that we had a clear improvement with this clean fingerprints, and um, so we were able to use. Um, uh, to use uh, um, deep learning also not only for the reconstruction of the fingerprints, but also for cleaning the fingerprints to um, to remove this undersampling artifacts. So, and um, so um, for the for the last five minutes, I would like to give you just a very very broad overview um, of other projects uh, that I find interesting. So. Um, when I started with um, when I started with um, this project, there were no other um, published work um, going in this direction. And if you just Google it now, it, it's it's exploding. So it's very amazing how many work was done since there. And um, so at the beginning, um, there was um, also some other. Um, simple architectures like in this work, so it is only um, or it is a um, four layers fully connected network, and um, it was also trained on um, mostly simulated data, and was tested. Um, it was the first one that was also tested on uh, measured fingerprints, so on these undersampled ones, and they also get um, good results for simulated data, but. Uh, and, and for the NIVO scan, they compared their results with um, literature values. But here, um, here you can see that the reconstruction is not, um, not really high, quali uh, high quality, but it was the first one that tried to, uh, to apply um, this uh, network directly to measured ones. Yeah. Um, then uh, um, other papers um, that came up after that were um, they um, already um, tried to include some some kind of uh, improvement. For example, this one um, that was already trained on in vivo data. They had um, also just a simple convolutional neural network, but um, they used uh, patches um, of data as input and already used the complex data here. And the loss here was also weighted in, res uh, in respect to the values. So, and they, um, yeah, um, the, uh, they also had first experiments with a reduced am amount of data point. That means that they, um, they, um, they um, had just, uh, for example, 50% of data points within one fingerprint as input for their network. And <clears throat> they saw that it's also possible to only use uh, a part of uh, points from the fingerprints to to reconstruct data. Uh, yeah, and um, then um, other architectures try to um, not only use the spatial 
um, the special neighbors, but also um, um, temporal uh, relations within uh, the architecture. For example, this one from Basing et al. They used uh, spatial and temporal blocks. And um, again, they used um, special patches and complex um, data as the uh, input. And um, what was special about this paper is that um, here they had a very um, large dictionary and uh, a very multi-dimensional um, multi um, uh, reconstruction because um, they had five parametric dimensions instead of two as uh, most of the uh, other work. Um, and it was a first one that was trained on a very large um, data pool of, with patients data. And they also, uh, one of the conclusions here was that um, the finger pride reconstruction is uh, not as good uh, or is worse than using patches. And um, so um, after that, um, there, wa there was a direction that uh, is going um, to, um, to using somehow some kind of compression step prior to the uh, deep learning reconstruction. For example, this one, they used a PCA in front of, um, of their network. Uh, and they, they, um, they said that um, this uh, reduces um, the noisy uh, the noisy, uh, noisy outliers also because uh, the PCA reduces noise in the fingerprints. And um, another approach uh, was also a two-step uh, two approach where a fully connected uh, neural network was used to first compress, uh, compress the fingerprints and afterwards they were feed it um, to the reconstruction network. Um, and the advantage here is that if you don't use uh, some, if you use a neural network for the compression, uh, it is a nonlinear mapping instead of a linear transform like PCA or SVT. Yeah, and um, yeah, afterwards they uh, used uh, the well-known unit for the reconstruction, and um, they used the whole slice, uh, the whole compressed slice um, as input. Yeah. And um, the last one I would like to show you is the combination of um, deep learning based uh, method together with um, iterative methods. So here that um, they applied uh, a kind of iterative total variation based um, reconstruction on the fingerprint, uh, which uh, compresses the fingerprint. And after that, they apply also a quite uh, quite simple neural network because the fingerprint here is now cleaned and compressed. Yeah, and um, here on the, in the qualitative results, you can see that the noise is uh, largely reduced here. Yeah, so um, uh, for the summary and conclusion of my talk, uh, I would like to say that um, MR fingerprinting is a recently proposed quantitative method which is uh, which has great potential, I think, because uh, a multiple dimension can be sampled at once with um, this technique. So you can you can sample the T1 and T2 and uh, many more quantitative parameters with only one acquisition. But um, the state of the art uh, reconstruction method uh, is based on a slow and expensive uh, simple pattern matching approach. And here, of course, the deep learning approach uh, is well suitable to replace um, this, um, this pattern matching uh, by being fast, accurate, and it also can accelerate the acquisition itself because if the deep learning is capable of reconstructing um, the parameter maps from a shorter acquisition, it will, of course, shorten the acquisition time. And um, uh, one uh, one big one uh, big aspect here is that we have these clean fingerprints in the dictionary that are quite quite uh, a simple problem for a deep learning uh, uh, for a deep learning approach, but we also have this strong uh, undersampling influences during the scans that makes the whole process much harder, and um, there are a lot 
of methods and different architectures now out there that um, especially have two aims that um, first of all now um, one tries to pre-process the fingerprint somehow by um, suppressing noise or artifacts and um, the second step is now the pattern matching and um, there are also approaches that combine a um, conventional technique to compress or to reduce artifacts and afterwards the neural network is um, applied for the reconstruction. And of course there are also uh, approaches with different inputs, so we use now whole slices instead of single fingerprints and uh, rather we use uh, um, complex data than magnitude data. So um, there are a lot of uh, challenges and open questions there. So uh, first of all, of course, uh, we have the simulation versus in vivo. How can we uh, transform the great uh, results from the simulations to the in vivo case? We have um, a multi-dimensional input data because we have this um, whole slices with uh, the fingerprints and complex data, we somehow need a compression here. And another interesting point, I think, is so most of the works use um, the dictionary approach for generating the ground truth data, but um, the dictionary um, by itself is not, um, or in some cases, is not the real ground truth data because the dictionary is only discrete. So here, I think uh, one, um, one further direction would be to compare this dictionary matching approach with, um, with another quantitative method and with deep learning. So this was not done um, so far um, from uh, my point of view. Yeah, and of course, generalization is also still a problem because most of the works use uh, use the same anatomy, the same orientation, the same undersampling for training and testing, but there are quite, um, there are not really approaches that try to generalize between undersamplings, anatomies, or um, um, other kind of settings, for example, so far. Yeah, and um, I would uh, like to thank um, um, Andreas Meyer and my whole uh, pattern recognition lab team for supporting me during my time there and I would because we are um, in close collaboration with Siemens Health and Neos who, who provided me um, the data for this project I would also like to thank the whole uh, pre-development team um, at Siemens Health and Neos especially Heiko Meyer, Josef Pfeuffer, Gregor Kurzdörfer, Matthias Nitka and Peter Speyer and I would like to thank you for your attention if Thank you for having me here, and I'm happy to take questions from your side. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Elisabeth. So um, I'm happy to moderate some questions now. I've seen there's one which is posed from Tim Ahler. So he asks, mm -hmm. For your experiments concerning the cleaning of the fingerprints, did you train yeah. the cleaning network separately from the actual prediction network? And what do you think would happen if you trained both networks in unison? Yeah, so we yeah, trained so the both train the networks both uh, in a separate way. So we first trained the cleaning network and afterwards we clean the um, network for the reconstruction. And um, this end-to-end -end learning is, of course, an interesting point that we will definitely investigate in the future. So I think uh, by end-to-end -end learning, um, the first network will learn to extract um, the patterns that are really needed for the subsequent reconstruction. So I think that um, uh, by end-to-end -end learning that um, the results will be better because uh, now, the first network will be extracting the real relevant information that is needed for the second one. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your answer at the moment. Are there yeah. some questions? So, I don't see another question. So. Yeah, we would like to thank you 
for being part of our data science seminar. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I would like to thank you again for inviting me. So it was a great honor for me to uh, to give you the talk. So thank you. Yeah, thank you again. We wish you all the best. Stay healthy. Thank you. And you hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.